Evening everyone, uh, I'm on the, uh, the Aylesbury line uh, on a rather knackered Chilton Turbo uh, on what I'd like to point out, oh, actually I, I, I didn't notice this, uh, Paul who sat behind me noticed this, um, on a rather uh, hard seat and these are originally fitted so uh, hashtag seat chat. Anyway, um, welcome to, 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 to all who are watching and listening, uh, I'm off to do a thing today. Um, actually, it's AM. It's been very AM for quite a while. It's not quite so bad anymore. And the aircon's just switched on, which helps. We're off to go and see... Actually, I say one thing. It's three things all smooshed into one very tight spot. In fact, into one single arable field, in fact. Um, but what are we going to go and see? So here we are, we're on the site, um, and we are on, it's, a, it's, a, it's an arable field that has become probably going to be the busiest construction site on HS2. Yeah. Getting on a minibus. Yeah. And then COVID hit, and we needed everybody to come in separate vehicles, so we had to accommodate more car parking space. Yeah. And all over. Did you have a mate? Yeah, Chalfont, 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 mate. Had anyone accidentally taken a wrong turn? When the factory sensors test is completed, there's 200 lorries for each TBM. Do you bring the right parts? So we, we, there we are, we just hopped off the minibus and, uh, wait a minute, what am I going to look at behind? I don't even need this on, but I've got it on. Well, what I'm looking at behind is, uh, and I'm going to get an even better view of it in a minute. Behind me is the South Portal of HS2. Look at the scale of the thing, it's massive. And behind me, there is one of the, I think that's Cecilia, the TBM that's still working its way in. Just. We're going to go and stand on a platform with an even better view in a minute, but I thought I, I couldn't resist saying, looking at this. And with uh, with Cecilia behind me, all I really need to say is, um, welcome to tonight's Rail Natter. <laughs> And as the InCity 225 fades away, I've, uh, I've run up to the, well, I've, I've not, I've been ushered up to this viewing platform, which has an even better view. So the, here they are, the Southern Portals. So you can see Cecilia's uh, working its way in, and then behind Florence is already well under, uh, beyond the M25 now, I believe. And these machines are absolutely immense. The diameter of these tunnels, I think it's 9.1 meters. Um, we're gonna go and look at some of the segments later. The scale of that is absolutely spectacular. I, just superlatives. I, uh, this is gonna be yet another one, which is impossible to fit within an hour, but I'm going to do my best. <laughs> I mean, there's so much to go through. We just had a fantastic... Uh, Adrienne has just gone through and explained much to us, and Rob as well, with lots of information, which I'll try and convey over to you. But so behind, you can see the, the, the material being bored out of the, uh, the TBMs. Um, lots to talk about the TBMs as well themselves, but I'm going to get down there and I'll hopefully do some filming and explain that then. But, but let's talk about the material coming out. So this chalk slurry, this sort of mixture of stone, uh, of kind of chalk flint, uh, moisture and other kind of kind of material comes out through here. So it comes out through these, these white pipes that you can see that I'm kind of pointing out behind me. If I hold this up here, white pipes. And actually it comes and it, it goes in here, doubles down at an event and it actually goes down here comes back and then it comes back again and obviously that's, that's because it's a bit weird at the moment because it's not in the tunnel yet um, and that actually comes so if I hold this behind me those these pipes then trace back there into a slurry plant there's the the slurry plant here uh, they settle it's one it's I think it's the largest slurry treatment plant for this sort of material in the world I was one of the this this site is just superlative after superlative 
slurry settles and then you can see actually behind me the trot material being where is it can you see that i think yeah you can see it being spat out there the dry material song water uh, kind of uh, it's been demoisturized um uh, spits out there and then that's then going to get transported via whole roads that are made out of that dry material add um to the uh, to the kind of the quarry site that's good getting it redeveloped as part of the habitat stuff which is the part three the three things that's the third part which i'll talk about later so yeah that's where the material goes um what else what else can i say uh what else can i say jeff it's just jeff have you run out of, have you run out of uh, super superlatives yet no i haven't there's so many i've got all the numbers and stats that i'm kind of trying to work out how to i'm scripting on the hoof you all rail ladder viewers you know what i'm like you can see the machine behind this is a really fantastic view of it 170 meters long or 180 meters long 2200 tons um lots of unique features because of the length of these tunnels these are huge tunnels 16.028 i believe um kilometers long uh, and they run so that's a huge length so the main challenge of this is that these are an incredibly long uh, length of tunnel which means that this these tbms have to have all of the machinery all of the facilities that oftentimes for tunneling you'd have on the site you'd have on the surface or you'd have on the shaft they can't do that for these because the lengths are all for example the batching to create some of the grout that gets put in to fill up voids that are found around the tunnels that's all being done on the machines all being done here huge amounts of stuff to be that, that, that unique features of the tunnel and there are other unique features of these tbms um that uh, i'll hopefully go through when we're next to them uh, shortly so we've come down right down to the level at which the uh, the tbms are working uh again i've just overwhelming amounts of stuff i've got a load of b-roll as we drove past in the uh in the van in the minivan um so behind is this slurry plant that i was showing you earlier and we also have filmed a load of um, reinforcement cages for the for the, the segments each that each of the 112,300 segments 56,000 ish in each individual bore um, each of those is 8.5 tons they are uh, around about two meters in in kind of uh, length along the railway um, there are seven of them in each ring and each of those seven is different so you've got so they all lock into place very carefully um and there are oh, how many uh eight thousand ish more uh individual segments as uh, kind of going on well i suppose divide 16.028 by by two right um anyway so that's that's one direction but you probably want to look at the business end which is there's a van look you can see down one of the tunnels see down one of the actual tunnels it's absolutely amazing so uh, down there florence is already well well advanced 300 meters i think down into the uh, no more than that actually nearly the best part of 500 uh, meters down into the into that uh, into that well soon to be tunnel Cecilia is a little further behind. Um, Cecilia is only, uh, only I think about nine or ten meters in. I, I think uh, kind of slowly working, uh, working its way through as a machine. Um, just absolutely spectacular to be down here. So here we go. We're going to go and have a closer look at uh, closer look at Cecilia, the uh, the second TBM. We just had it confirmed by uh, Adrienne that. Um, Florence is 363 segments in, so times that by two, and Cecilia is only nine rings in, so 18 meters in. So here we go, walking through the threshold. But actually, you can see if we're talking about P-Way, uh, here's here's uh, here's some serious broad gauge P-Way going on. Uh, there we are down behind me there, nice bit of broad gauge P-Way with a with a TBM on it. So. Uh, if you want to see some that's pretty extreme some pretty impressive uh, quite flat squished look at this gant rail there's some gantry rail here uh quite flat flat bomb anyway so for the p-way buffs well, there you go so uh looking after the TBM. safety first you can see that uh this 180 meter 2200 ton tbm has uh some rear red lights for safety <laughs> so that you see it see where it is so there we go uh i'm just going to stand i'm going to rotate now everyone's taking photos and enjoying themselves but this view behind is this view behind is look at that absolutely spectacular incredible looking right up to the cutting face down through inside the tbm absolutely amazing look it's uh, it's jeff filming um behind me in fact you can hear it right you can hear that that sound i don't know how good my shotgun mic is but i think you can hear it if i walk ever so slightly this way and stand just here where i'm still close to the team but not not miles away from everything and listen to listen to that noise
that is the sound of 1265 cubic meters of slurry and uh, which is which is a mix actually a mixture made from the cutting head so behind us the, the cutting head but you can see it's here it's gone quiet again so some of that material is not coming through but it gets mixed everything that gets cut gets mixed with water and then sent up these pipes extracted and then it's treated in the slurry plant slurry plant that we filmed earlier now that it's actually switched off or now that now that noise is, is stopped suddenly you realize how quiet this site is this is this is you know the, the this is the and will be the busiest site along the whole HS2 route, including phase two and A and B, and it's quiet. Listen to that. I mean, don't get me wrong, there are surges of noise, but at the moment, you know, it's it's quite peaceful. So hopefully, I'm getting everything that I can stitch together for you all. But um, we're crossing again, crossing the path across these machines. It's just incredible. We're about to go through a little a little box. There we are. Well, there's some blueprints of the uh, of the machine itself. That's exciting. So behind me, you can see these are the pipes that carry all that slurry along. These, there's just various diameters of pipe. I presume there's some sort of filtering mechanism and valve mechanism at the other end to uh, to send various different things up to the processing plant, the slurry processing plant behind. So here we are walking up. Uh, if I get my gloving shot, we're walking up along, and you can see actually the cutting there, uh, the cutting wall here, which uh, the excavation in order to, well, you know. You can see the scale of the uh, of the face of the tunnel portal here. And likewise with this bump, there's many. This is a construction site, so there's lots of hazards around. You have to pay attention to. Hi. So, look at the scale of the. Oh, this is impressive. Right. Okay. This is incredible. So behind me here is a 9.1 meter diameter tunnel, looking up through the in less than a decade we'll have trains running through it at speeds of over 250 kilometers an hour absolutely spectacular look at that you can see the lights disappear in fact i showed you the rear view lights of um, the red lights on the back of cecilia you can see florence's red lights that's what they're for you can see where it is <laughs> at the back absolutely spectacular of course where i'm standing now will still be tunnel will actually be constructed as the tunnel portal because of the speed these trains are going the dynamic the aerodynamic pressures mean that they will have a very long extended tunnel portal with slots to dissipate that uh, that energy of the of essentially the, the, the bow wave the sound wave that these trains create as they push into the tunnel so there'll be this long constructed concrete portal with slots in it that will dissipate that energy <laughs> my, my video guy there's just going to be lots of clips of you do you want to come on all my videos and you could, you could just narrate every so what I want to do is behind here, so not too far in behind here is the cutting phase, only about nine segments in I believe, so 18 meters or so. Um, so what this TBM does that's, that's fairly unique, I don't know exactly how unique, but certainly fairly unique here, is that, so most tunnel boring machines, they do, they, they're doing two things at once. They are uh, boring and then they are building. I'm just going to move to one side because there's a vehicle coming past. we go into the, uh, there we are, we're moving in so that we're nice and safe. Ah, because of this. saying that this that the TBM uh, they usually do two things they bore and they build and normally they do that they bore and they are then pushing off the uh, the previous segments ring and then they, there's almost a kind of a stop start as they as they push the tunnel forward the unique thing about this um, or fairly unique um, is that actually what it's doing is uh, it's relying on the partially built new segment to push the, 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 the head forwards so actually what's happening is that you get a continuous bore it's do it's both boring and building at the same time so 
we have an invert bridge to allow us in parallel of the tunnel advancing to build a 600 to 700 uh, mil of invert concrete slabs which will raise the useful section of the tunnel oh, okay, and yeah, will allow yeah. two MSV to come in and out Right. because right. with one MSV that yeah. will work for another few dozen rings yeah. but then we start to be you a bit blocking. short yeah. because the cycle won't be fast enough for yeah. the machine to advance yeah. we're doing really good with the advance so now the ball is on the MSV and logistics side to supply us with all the materials so that we can continue yeah. to, allow, to allow us to do that we have an 83 meter long bridge which will allow both activity to be continuing in parallel as in MSV logistic at the top of the bridge and a team building the invert concrete automated pouring and leveling of the concrete at the back and installation of the drainage which will later on be used by our phase two contractors for the drainage of the final talent board this is what we are constructing. So a really critical thing to remember with tunnels is that the tunnel, the process of constructing a tunnel is, is multi-phase, lots of different things need to happen. First of all you need to do the site prep, you need to build the shafts, so on the critical path is actually getting the shafts built downwards in time that the TBM actually meets them. But also the lining is only part is only one part of the tunnel. Once you've built the lining, then you need to build in drainage and then the, the support, kind of the flat concrete bit. Um, at the invert so at the bottom end of the tunnel the kind of the the lower part of the the curved uh, circular tunnel shape um, now that will also uh, for this speed I, I don't actually know if there's any super elevation within the tunnel but if there is super elevation within the tunnel that that'll actually rotate within the tunnel as well so there's a huge amount that they have to do so the the team so this jv is sort of in phases the first the the, the french contractor that's doing the tunnel work um will hand over the tunnel once they've done that initial first concrete pour at the bottom part at the invert of the of the circular tunnel so while I've got them behind me, of course, the other thing, you see these two tunnels, you see the distance between them. It's not even just the two main tunnels, the two 16 kilometer main tunnel boards that have been built. They're cross passages. Uh, I don't exactly know the frequency of them, but they're every so hundred, so many hundred meters. There are lots and lots, huge numbers, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of meters of cross patches that need to be built, connecting the two so that if there's a problem in one tunnel, passengers or staff can work their way, you know, safely move into the other. So there's a huge amount, and also the movement of vent you know, ventilation as well, the aerodynamic forces, all these things aerodynamically designed within the tunnel as the trains go through so a huge amount of things you have to think about not just boring the nice big clean tunnel through the middle so there we go I mean that was uh that was us having a look uh, I don't know how this is going to sit in the edit but uh you you, you, got, you all don't mind the continuity but what I can't I'm just holding on to a barrier there to make sure I'm safe there you see the slurry pipes behind me um Scale. Scale is the I was just taught, I think I might have mentioned on Jeff's video, you know, cross rail tunnels, 6.4, I think, or around 6.5 meter uh, diameter. These are 9.1, so massive, massive diameter. Uh, that's to fit all the, uh, that's not only to fit the, the wider gauge, all the additional ancillary equipment, but it's also because you need a wider kinematic envelope to deal with the dynamic effects, the air pressure, as the vehicles, you know, these trains will whiz through at uh, a fair old lick. I don't exactly know, they're slightly reduced through the tunnels. I believe uh, so it might be 280 kilometers an hour or, or I think it's 280 I think that's the speed they go at so it's slightly reduced from their maximum uh, operating speed of uh, well the cruising speed of 320 and then uh, and then 360 is their maximum that they'll be going at so they're able to go over the bridge over the viaduct at 320 the viaduct in in that direction which we'll talk about later so I'm um, actually while I'm waffling along um, so I've alluded to the fact that there are it's a, it's a rail natter, so I'm diving all over the place. I've alluded to the fact that there are three things going on here. Number one are the tunnels, they're behind. Number two is the is the viaduct. So the tunnels are the long, both two of them, 16 kilometers long, are the longest tunnels, railway tunnels in, in the UK. And the closest up behind that is the, I think the uh, nine-ish kilometer um, uh, HS1 L L London tunnel number two, I think is the second longest, uh, rather unglamorous. And then the uh, 3.4 kilometer long viaduct, that's the number two thing, um, is will be the longest railway viaduct in, in Britain. I know a lot of people say, oh, but what about London Bridge? It doesn't count, it's got lots of broken segments and extra bits in it. So those two things. The third thing is habitat creation, and I will be talking about that when we get back to the exhibition centre later on.
there's a little factoid I told you earlier, right, about the about the fact that this will um, the TBMs this is fairly unique uh, an innovation for this project that they will both um, bore and build. Well, that's gained that sim fairly. I mean, I say simple. It's not that simple. Um, that innovation, along with the fact that they also have rather than individual dials or a joystick to vary the centre of pressure of the tunnel. So if you vary the pressure, so you increase the pressure at the top of the cutting head it'll it'll dive down and vice versa that's now a touchpad so rather than joysticks now a touchpad very futuristic all of those have gained efficiencies of potentially 20 to 30 percent um, of the rate of tunneling so it's so really quite impressive and um, we're just coming through into the into one of the rather, rather snazzy buildings it smells a lot like lunch i'm immediately hungry Hello, uh, so I've come to, well, I happen to be just walking on the site. You can see the site there, there over there behind me. There's some fence that I haven't filmed for very long. Um, why have I come to stand next to the sign? Well, it's because one of the tunnel boring machines that I've just stood next to, the one that's only nine segments in, uh, was named for Cecilia Payne Kaposhkin, who was, uh, she was born in 1900 uh, in Buckinghamshire, hence why I'm next to this sign. And her, um, her love, her great love, she was an astronomer and an astrophysicist eventually. She studied at Oxford, but wasn't, you know, she studied for and should have been awarded a degree, but, you know, men. So she wasn't allowed, to, you know, Oxford didn't award degrees to women until 1948. So she went to Harvard to actually do, you know, the only thing that learned women could do in this country, basically, for a very long time, is become a teacher. Uh, so she went to America, where they were much more forward-thinking than we are. Uh, went to Harvard, and she fairly quickly, as part of her thesis, came up with the idea that the sun and other stars... Um, are formed of hydrogen and helium gas and not just a lump of rock, ferrous rock like we're on. People at the time, the understanding was that the sun was just a hotter version of, of, of the earth, but bigger. And they said, oh, if you heat it up that much, it'll look the same and emit the same as the sun, which is nonsense, of course, because the sun, as we know now, is a ball, or at least to our best understanding, is a ball of hydrogen and, and helium fusion reactions going on in, in loop. Um, and and she, she proposed this, and, and her name didn't really get associated with that finding, which, which was made formally by a blokey four years later in 1929. So I thought it was worth putting in an explanation for why that um, tunnel... Everyone knows why the other one was called Florence, right? Florence Nightingale. I think it's Florence Nightingale, wasn't it? Uh, but um, Cecilia, Cecilia Hengaposchkin. Walking through the site, and you, so we've got multiple batching plants. We've got a batching plant here, and there's another batching plant over behind me there. Batching plants are where cement is combined to make concrete, which is then used for various things. Uh, in this case, a lot of the concrete is being used to create the uh, the two precast things that are being created here. Number one are the 56,000 times two, so what is it, 112,300 segment uh, segment units that are um, that will line the top. Tunnel, and the other are the 1,000-ish precast, uh, each in each different, I think, segments that will um, uh, be as part of the used as part of the viaduct construction as well. So behind me, right now, we have. Uh, I'm going to dive through this red gate, so I'm on the safe side. Just a second. I'm going to go and stand behind Mr. Bigland and Fran. Um, right, there we are. So there's the screw. There we are. There's a reinforcement mesh of one of the 8.5 ton segments. Seven a ring and 112,000 plus of these in, the, in both tunnels in total. 56,000 each of the 16.028 uh, length tunnels. Absolutely incredible. So there we are. And you can see the shapes. Uh, each, so there are seven per ring. And each of those is individually, each of those is uniquely cast so that they lock perfectly in into place. I'm going to be very careful here to make sure I'm safe. It's a very loud sight. Jeff is there filming behind me. Um, there's a lot of all sorts of... There is a bit noisier over here now. Now you can also see some of the formwork. So you can see over here, in fact I'm going to go over here and step through into this safe red here, past the red. The safe now and film. This uh, this is formwork for each of the... So, the, each of the, so these are probably spares because the others will be in use casting those segments so there you, are, you see the formwork each of these will surround those segments concretely poured in around the reinforcing mesh look at these so i'm here but I'm, I'm tapping my hand on one of those reinforcement cages that'll be within those segments it's just spectacular to be here so here they are the pre-castings uh, sorry the uh 
the, the formwork that will allow the casting of these segments. So these are all placed here. These will be getting uh, fabricated somewhere. There's so many buildings. I mean, the, the, this is enormous. What I find incredible is the scale of this is huge, and yet it's all happening within one former arable field. <laughs> it's incredible. You look at it on the map, it's just one field, and yet it's scale. I mean, it was a big field, granted. The scale, there's a batching plant up there creating concrete. Those, the, the concrete, and actually behind me, I think now this building, this huge building, is a building within which they are manufacturing the viaduct segments. So uh, the number two thing that's being done um, are the viaduct segments being preformed in there. So just the scale is enormous. Concrete being made, that concrete is being used in both to construct both of those precast shapes, as I think I've probably said about six times. Another thing you notice, this is a site that's got to be here for years, years and years, and so it needs to work. So there's lots of drain, well, in fact, this isn't just, this is troughing for cable routes, so for cabling that's being put to make sure the site's functioning. You know, this is a full, building this site itself for the, for the, for the Align JV, building the site was a civil engineering project in and of itself, let alone actually then creating a railway afterwards. So there's drainage everywhere, there's troughing with all the required kind of MEP ca cabling and everything. These structures are, are sizable, a huge amount of work that had to happen. This just temporary works. This will get wiped off the face of the planet once the railway's finished. Spectacular. So we've just now gone into one of the uh, one of the buildings within which they will be constructing these segments. This is the fact. It's essentially a fact. Well, it's not essentially. It is a factory. And you can see behind here, one of the segments being constructed. Look, there's more track around to make this all work. So there's some sort of miniature flat bottom rail is over there. That's quite nice. Uh, over there. So you can see. I mean, this is this is a dusty site. We've got, I've usefully got my mask on. We're not in here for very long, but I dare say the people in here regularly will probably have breathing equipment. You can see all of the various bits and pieces required that now there'll be presumably there'll be smalls that'll have to be set within the, the units that need to you know rubber lining loops for example these aren't just a lump of concrete they're actually a very they're millimeter refined tolerances but you can see i'm walking through some slop concrete has to come from somewhere this is a mess this is a factory that's making equipment that's uh, equipment material segments that are millimeter tolerances but using as a permanent way engineer, I'm very familiar with using civil engineering materials, but getting mechanical engineering tolerances. That's what permanent way engineering really is. Again, you can see some of the equipment there for uh, casting the these segments. And behind me, if I just was around, you can see some of those segments piled up. Uh, just to make sure I'm careful of my footing. Uh, there we are. Very nice. There, and you can see this, it's not just a sink. These things are very carefully machined. See, they've got rubber linings. They'll have screw holes for, uh, they'll have things like grouting holes so that you can put, um, so you can actually inject um, grout into and around them. Look at these, look at these segments here. Segments being formed, segments behind us piled up. Um, look at the scale, look at the scale of this place. Absolutely massive. There's an induction board, which I'm gonna, you can see behind me this monopoly board induction. I think that's quite clever. Anyway, that was, that was enough. That was, that was enough of my waffling. Uh, we're going to have um, David is going to tell us a bit more in in more detail, uh, and he actually knows the stuff and isn't making up as he goes along like I am. Uh, what we do in here, we've got 49 moulds that we cast as quickly as possible. Our target production is one mould every 11 minutes. So during a shift, we're targeted to cast 49 segments per shift. So over the two shifts, two factories, we're targeting 196 segments per day. So each position along the line, there's a different function. So starting over here, you've got the demolding station where you take the segment out that's already been cast and you'll clean the mold, mold, oil the mold, put the gaskets and inserts in and then cast the mold again, finish the concrete and it's basically just like a, a fairground carousel going round and round in a circle. So every 11 minutes, one of the moulds will move to the next position, next position, like that. Uh, we've got a curing oven over there, the, the large building you see over there. So in there, there's three channels. Each channel has 13 positions in it. So the curing oven holds 39 moulds, the working line holds 10 moulds. So equals 49. So once, when, they, when they're cast and they go in the oven, seven hours later, they come to this position and they're ready to take out again and they're fully cured. So they'll be lifted out of the mould, They'll be put on the turntable, the turning machine will turn them over and then the guys over here will do the quality checks, insert, uh, put a couple more inserts in, guiding rods, things like this and then this stacking uh, device picks it up again, transfers it over to here, the pre-storage carousel 
where they'll be putting their stacks ready for the TBM. So when they're stored here, they're already in the three and the four, ready to go down to the tunnel and uh, installed in the tunnel. So once they go out from here, 24 hours later they stay in here, they'll go outside and that's where they'll get put into the storage yard. And they'll spend approximately 28 days before they're taken down to the tunnel. So we're pointing out there are actually two factories. So within this massive building, there's the factory here behind with the curing and all the, the there, which are, and then the other side here, factory two, which are doing the same thing. Double the output. P-Way, look. <laughs> More flat, little flat bottom rails. Incredible. Behind me is uh, one of the, the one of the casting things. So this the, the casting devices. Um, this incredible. They're getting oiled up. So some of them go in. There's a process by which they're going in, going out. They get all cleaned and oiled. Um, all the shapes you can see behind. Uh, you can see there. Uh, and you can see actually this one's already prepped with all the various sort of small parts, steel, um, and there's uh, there's the the gasket. So that what they call the gasket, those rubber rings to seal it, make it waterproof. Uh, I'm going to show you a very snazzy shot of me putting the camera up over into Boxham. Uh, right now, literally as I'm, while I'm saying these words, it's now playing and you're seeing it. That's how good modern technology is of a telephone. <laughs> right, so this factory is all about processes, process, process, process. And behind me, you can see there's actually a robot here which does one of the really horrible, grueling tasks. There are two really grueling, horrible, labor intensive, and, and ri therefore risk exposing tasks. One of them is preparing the mold, cleaning it out, and, and getting everything lined up. The other is actually finishing the concrete. Um, so, finishing the surface when it's complete. Here you can see. Um, if you imagine getting in there and scrubbing it out and cleaning out huge, uh, nasty work, trips, slip, trip, fall risks, you're dealing with grease, you're in, in here for ages doing it, so you get loads of dust exposure. So robotizing, automating it, getting a robot to do it, gets rid of that, that's, there's the staff risks, makes the, makes the site safer uh, and improves the well-being of the staff um, and means that you don't have a, as, uh, as Paul just pointed out, it means that also the boss, if you've annoyed the boss, there isn't a task that you can get sent to that's really horrible. Um, so this process, I've just talked about process of cleaning, then it gets greased and then, and then at the far, far end, these are all getting worked through, so they have lots of, so it's a process of these being renewed, cycled, cycled as they're casting these new, you know, um, you know however many it is a, a day, you know, constant, huge numbers of these things getting churned out. Casting, casting, um, by the time they reach, yeah, you're all right. Um, by the time they, they reach the end, they've been checked to make sure the to they're all to tolerance. Get these right. This is critical. You've got to get these right so they have the tolerances. Get these right. You have the tolerances right, the millimetre tolerances on those 8.5 tonne segments. There's a load of gaskets behind me. They look like, Jeff said they look like inner tubes, and I think that's spot on. They do look like inner tubes, actually. They have a very large penny farthing. Another thing that I've never done on any those three stations, they're set tasks for each station, but really it's whatever order you want to do it. And as long as on the final station everything's done and ready to cast it, then we don't really care. So this one, because they've gone to break, they normally cast the last one, they have to push it out, finish it, just so, you know, they, if they go to break for one hour, it's all done. And then when they come back, they'll move the line and it's ready to cast the next one. The mould is 3.44 or something like that. So the, the it takes two flying hot buckets to fill this. And here we have it, having come through that process, gets kicked out of here and out, and you can see a you can see all the formwork. You can see one of the segments here, one of the actual tunnel segments behind me. Uh, you'll notice the bit that's exposed is the part where the tolerance is least important, so all the internal, to inter internal surfaces are critical for tolerance. The external surface there is the back surface into, into the cut face, less critical, to, so it, that's why that side is the, is the face that can be basically exposed concrete. So the tolerance is still, still fairly fine, but not as critical, so that's the exposed face of the, of the formwork. You can see here, it's still, it's still working its way through. Just uh, yeah. very, very cool to see, very, very cool. You can see down here, you can actually see all, this is a process, but it's also a mechanized process. This is moving them all through. You can see the chains that actually bring it along. So the last part of the process. They come out here, this is the last part of the, uh, you can see the wet, what they call the wet process, so the wet concrete. It then comes behind, it's, it's rolled on onto this trolley. This, this trolley then shifts it over where it's cured at 45 degrees. 
um, I'm just gonna make sure I don't fall over, so I'm gonna concentrate on these steps. It's cured at 45 degrees for, um, so it's a lot, I mean, it's concrete, isn't it? So, you know, it's designed to have, it, it's a requirement for it to reach its 28 day cube strength, just as any, any civil engineers out there remember from the university days, or any anyone out there who's mucked around with concrete, uh, 28 day curing strength, but actually they're reaching those in about, I think they said about 14 days, or maybe even less, maybe it's four days. So they're getting that strength pretty quickly with their curing process. Um, and we're about to walk out. So we're, once again, I'm walking through, you can see the, where the, the concrete comes out from me. I've got my nice thumb in, in, in shot there. There's an actual professional broadcaster behind me here who doesn't get his thumb in shot ever. Uh, whereas I do it probably about three in, about one in three shots, I'll have my thumb in it. Um, there we are, there's, let's see, so concrete is out there and water is down here. That's why we're in PPE. We're going to watch Jeff do something very special behind us now, actually. Well, I just want to be able to say in years to come, I touch the ring of... Get the barcode so you know exactly so which, know one, which it is. one it is. Yeah, yeah. Let's go, let's go watch Jeff have his special, special moment here. Here he is. Okay. Just witness that. Isn't it beautiful? It's nice, nice to share that moment with, with all of us there. Um, so yeah, David just explained really neatly there. As I was talking earlier about this unique feature, the fact that this both bores, that this the TBMs bore and build. In order to do that, they, the, the machine can actually push off with, I think it was three segments laid, the machine can actually then retract its hydraulic uh, kind of jacks and then place them against those new segments and push forward only with three. So actually that allows, and then it can continue laying those segments of the seven. That allows the the machine to continue moving steadily forward rather than kind of a bit of a stop start as the as each segment, traditionally you finish a segment, move the jacks, place those, then push forwards, retract jacks, new segment go in, replace jacks, push forwards. I'll put that video up from the uh, from the uh, uh, from the NRM. But anyway, that is that. Uh, Jeff just touched it, so why, why, why can't I? Here is one of these. Look at this. This is a tunnel segment. 8.5 tons each of these. As I've said about 20 times, 8.5 tons. Uh, tw uh, 112,300 of them. Uh, seven per segment. Epic. Absolutely. Epic. And you can see these. Here, here's the grommet that goes. Uh, the, the, the gasket. Sorry, that goes around it. Rubberized. All rubberized to make sure that it fits snugly both both snug fit and thanks thanks very much indeed snugly and uh, I'm, I'm holding everyone up so they're, they're very very gently and politely placing a hand on my shoulder to get me moving there they are fine watertight of course as well <laughs> they've got to be watertight so that's part of the reason in fact you can see see one here on its way out through through the curing oven actually it's um, coming through the curing oven there now having waffled on a bit i'm now squeezing my way through a bit of a tight spot so going through here we are on our way to look at uh, so this thing to step over very carefully uh, just yeah, everyone spotted that very good we're on our way out to an absolutely spectacular sight this it's like, I don't even know how to describe it, other than I'm going to stand, I'm going to wait for David to shout at me if I get too close, but this, here's the gantry holding them up, and behind me, here they all are, waiting, ready to be used. Absolutely incredible. All of these, all of these pre all of these segments, they're just segments as far as the, you can see, segments, 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 as far as the eye can see. This gives an idea of the scale, the length of these tunnels. They are massive. They are absolutely massive. And look behind me. Look behind. Look at this, this, this alleyway here behind of, of segments. Only three months worth. As with all engineering, it's a delicate balance. All the different disciplines have to make sure everyone's doing everything right. So if they produce too many segments, they fill up the yardage and they're, they actually clog themselves up. The factory's no longer able to operate. If they, operate, if they create too few, or if the tunnel boring machine's moving too fast, the tunnel boring machine will run out of segments. So there's a very fine balance. Really good communication has to happen across all the different teams to make sure that everyone is producing exactly the right map kit um, and that it's all going to the right, making sure it's all going to the right place all complete happy days absolutely spectacular I'm gonna walk down here just a little bit just so we can actually stand amongst it because just uh, this is just very cool to be stood amongst all this very very cool indeed look at this very very cool I'm gonna walk up here again so I don't get don't get left behind and lost Uh, 
it's a bit echoey in here, but uh, this is the, uh, hopefully you can hear me, this is the, this is like a nice exhibition room, there are many things here, which uh, I'm going to, I'm going to go around and explain and describe in some form of order, which will, I'll work out in the edit. So um, the first place I'm going to start is, is perhaps not with the tunnel itself, because yes, there is a, there it is, we're going we're to do that momentarily, but I'm going to start, it's very echoey, but sorry, I'm going to start with the, um, with the tunnel shafts, of which there are five, I think, along the 16 kilometres uh, length of the tunnels. So here's a nice little map uh, showing, the, showing the, the tunnel. You'll see in, in red here, uh, Chilton Tunnel. Uh, this is the southern portal and the northern portal, and then there are five, one, two, three, four, uh, five shafts. And you can see there's a, there's a, there's a building that's here, and uh, the shaft, there's the shaft. And up top, the building should look like, um, it'll look like this, this, look, look, a nice little, little sort of farm building thing. So the point of these buildings, these shaft built, you know, the, the, the shaft head houses and then the actual shafts themselves, is, is to provide, well, I mean, firstly, ventilation to the tunnels. Um, Elon, uh, take note, you'll, this, this bit's going to be useful education for you. So yeah, ventilation and also emergency access. So, so the, the, these can only be a certain spacing apart to provide emergency access and they also I, I, they also manage some of the aerodynamic impacts uh, through the tunnel as well as part of that ventilation. Um, so yeah, they, and they're actually a limiting factor. The, the placement of these uh, shafts is actually a limiting factor on capacity because they limit how many trains you can actually fit into the tunnel. It's a video showing the, 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 the go, they're going through, they are, TBM working its way through the bottom of the shaft. Uh, there's, there's, there's a nice uh, ventilation shaft. The magical things are appearing. Ooh. Uh, yep, and then they build the thing up top. Happy days, marvellous. So let's look at, uh, let, let's, let, we're talking of tunnels, uh, let's look at the, one of the TBMs in miniature form with LEDs. Um, there's a lovely model here built by, uh, the, well I presume created by the manufacturer of the TBM themselves. This one, this is kind of what they both look like. Uh, Herrenknecht is I think the, uh, the manufacturer uh, over in uh, Western Germany. Uh, I think they ship them over in, I might say this again later, they ship them over in I think 300 shipments, so as many multiples of, of, of bits and pieces required for that. But anyway, let's let's go alongside. So here 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 we go. So here's the back end of the of it, and you see all of the, the these platforms and I presume these these are the ventilation here going along. You can see all the equipment. There's 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 new new here. There's new new. Um, just enormous amounts of equipment. There are buttons to press. Buttons to press, by the way, as well. So here we are. Keep going along. You can see all this equipment, all the various sort of utilities and then we get into the business end here so the business end now uh, you can see there we go there's all the business end I'll do some more b-roll business end and then out here of course is the cutting head well now it's time to press some buttons so the uh, the power is on and uh, press if I press cutter head cutter head there we are it's rotating. I think there's a. Ver I think I've shown you all a version of this. In fact, I might slip it on a video of the um, of the tunnel boring machine from the Victoria Line that's in the where the warehouse in uh, in the National Railway Museum, and you can see how it works because it pushes itself forwards. Anyway, we'll get there. So the thrust cylinder. Now, let's see where that the thrust cylinder. I'm going to make the assumption is providing the actual force to drive the cutting head forwards. Uh, and actually, you can see all these little all these little pistons. They are actually having placed with the with the segments having been placed around it. These then apply pressure on the edge of the of the segments, which uh, which then allows the machine to push forwards. So let's go here. So apparently this one's not working. There's the erector. Uh, let's see. It's, it's in there, but it's not doing anything. So then we've got the screw conveyor. There we are. So what's that now doing? Oh, well, there's lots of things here that. Uh, I think more, so we've got inlet pipes, ah there we go, there's something illuminating, and I don't know, then the outlet pipes, which I'm sure we'll find out what they do momentarily, so I've just pressed outlet pipes, uh, there we are, and uh, and you can see the, the, so that's clay and all sorts being set at the back, and then if I click back up gantry, that's uh, inside here, so I assume all of these have lit up. Anyway, there we go, so I've already broken it, but there you are, that makes it all shiny and illuminated. So there are three things that, uh, that are happening in, in this um, diminutive site. Uh, I mean, I say diminutive, it feels pretty large when you're on it, but actually when you look at it from above, it's only really one arable field that they've taken up, um, as I'm sure I'll show you with some of the aerial footage. Anyway, three things. Number one, the tunnel. Uh, number three, uh, three, 
the um, the habitat work that's going on that I'll talk about a bit, I think, later on. But the, the second thing, so, you know, not only are they building the longest railway tunnel, or two, <laughs> two of the longest, the, the number one and number two longest railway tunnels in the UK, but also they're building the longest railway viaduct. And here's a nice model showing them how they do it. For all those people who share those videos of Chinese high-speed rail lines being built, well, that's how we, you know, with the machine going over the top of the viaduct. Yeah, well, that's how we do viaducts too. It's just that we can't build all of our rail in a viaduct because people would become very angry and it would involve a lot of concrete. Anyway, it's very loud and echoey. But uh, you can see there, there's a nice machine there lifting up the segments. These segments of which I think there'll be a thousand for the length of the bridge. It's 3.4 kilometer length viaduct. There we go. Look at that. I've been talking about the three different things. This rail mat is going to focus on the TBM and on the, on the tunnels. But I'm hoping then over there, He's there, look, making notes with Jeff. Uh, he's going to let me back to talk about the viaduct, but I thought, which is the number two thing, um, here it is, here's, here's a cutaway showing what the viaduct will look like. We're going to go and look at where it goes uh, momentarily. Uh, there you go, you can see that. The number three thing is the habitat, is this 127 acres of mixed habitat of chalk grassland, a very rare, it's going to be the largest area of chalk grassland in this region, in this part of the country. Um, it's also one of the largest ha chalk habitat rejuvenation or re regeneration projects in Europe. Um, and so this, this whole section here, it's all our, all our mess, very loud, sorry. Um, there's, there's some video things, of nice, nice sort of footage and sort of stats about the general green stuff. But stakeholder involvement as well. So this habitat, which, which I'm going to show you now, some footage of the habitat being constructed. It's going to raise that there's a quarry area that's being filled with the chalk, 2.5 million tons of the chalk that's being brought over. That's going to fill up this, this quarry, fill it up, all coming out the back of the TBM, all this stuff, filling up that quarry, 2.5 million tons. It's going to raise the level by 20 meters. I'm also showing you some footage now of the fact that you can't just dump that in the quarry. You have to prepare the ground, put drainage in and make sure that it as it lays in uh, that uh, it, it kind of you don't want to you want to avoid a Hatfield colliery slip type situation so I'm showing you some video now of that preparation work going on and, and, and adjacent to that is where the viaduct is being launched as well so there's some piling work a huge number of piles being put in I can't remember exactly how many there are um, for the I think 56 piers that will be uh, along the 3.4 uh, kilometer long viaduct so I don't I don't know how much I've ranted about this but this is the exhibition room and if we'll come back here again I think uh, if we're allowed to to talk about the viaduct but um, some really good stuff in here uh, useful a uh, good way to do outreach lots of kids come down here as well uh, lots of really good outreach um, it's a, a useful asset I think uh, uh, if people wonder oh why are you spending your money on this why are you spending your money on that the IEA and the TPA will be like oh so, it's because this sort of thing it, it expires the next generation of engineers we need more of engineers to do things like this to expand our urban transport networks as well and this is the sort of thing that can inspire them So I'm, I'm actually gone for a little walk now uh, uh, as a brief uh, brief interlude and I don't want to film the, the one thing they asked me not to do is film the perimeter fence because you know reasons security and all that but um, I think without me giving too much away I think you can sort of see uh, see some of the factory where we were earlier that's where the segments have been put together I can see you might see it through the gap the, the segment stockpile is, is visible but actually oh, so nice uh, we're just on a road verge but you know things grow out of road verges the reason I wanted to walk down here is basically to um, to talk about the other two things. So this video is focused, as I've already said, I think, on the on the tunnels. On the you know we were at the southern portal of the the Chiltern Tunnels. I kept saying the southern portal of HS2 is what you do when you're excitable, but I mean the southern portals of the Chiltern Tunnels of HS2, all uh, two times sixteen kilometres worth of them. But there's three point four kilometres worth of twin track viaduct heading southwards. So everything's being launched from this one site. And this one site, which, you know, I've just walked the length of it. It's kind of basically the width of this road. This is Denham, is it Denham Lane? Denham Road, something like that. Um, it's not very long, I'm just walking along it. And I'll put some Google Earth Eve stuff up. It's not, it's not a tremendous length. It really is not a tremendous length. And it disappears off. So it's going off that way and going this. It's just one, one field, really, where all of this hive of activity is happening. The stuff shooting southwards and shooting northwards. The viaduct's a little further behind the tunnels because the tunnels take longer and are slower. The, 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 bridge, the viaduct will sort of all happen quite quickly, I think. Um, but I'm hoping to come down and we'll do another one of these. Down here, same spot, talking about the viaduct. Um, but I am walking this way because I want to walk 
length of sight. But I also want to want to talk about the other thing, the other thing, the third thing, the third waggly finger that I've been waving around, um, which is the habitat work. 127 hectares worth of new chalk grassland, uh, woodland, uh, and some wetland as well. So a really, really real varied mixture of different habitats. Um, and it's being formed from a lot of the, so, so they're exhuming, I think the best part of three, maybe more, three and a half million tons of material of which 2.5 million will be uh, reused here. I think a lot of that's water, which gets drained away, but 3.5 million, uh, sorry, 2.5 million tons of chalk is going to be re kind of exhumed, chalk and flint is going to be uh, exhumed from the tunnels and reused here on site. So they're minimizing how much is disappearing off elsewhere, staying here. You can hear some of the work. What they're doing behind me is actually preparing a, a load of land, preparing kind of so, so drainage and uh, kind of a layer of bedding material before they lay that chalk down, before it gets spout. You saw me showing you the, uh, the slurry processing plant. Well, behind me you can hear it is a bit noisy you can hear the work that they're doing to prepare the ground before that chalk that's already started coming out there's a small amount that's been used now they're using that for haul roads within this site eventually that's all going to get landscaped out and they're lifting they're basically raising the land surface behind here to create this this new sort of raised chalk habitat it's going to be the largest of its kind in this area kind of in this kind of in this region really um and it'll be, it'll be a, an attraction in of itself, it'll be a local nature reserve attraction of its own. People are going to come and want to see the viaduct and the tunnels, people are going to be interested in that. Yep, I, I think it's, uh, I, you know, I've talked, I've talked extensively about habitats and about the impact HS2 has, but I think it's, it's seeing it happening, the, the, the physical work, the cost uh, here. This is, you know, it's a bit, you think of the Channel Tunnel, the Channel Tunnel, oh, there's a very loud grasshopper there. The Channel Tunnel exhumed a huge amount of uh, very similar material, in fact, it was chalk marl. And that was used to build Sam Far Ho, a massive nature reserve, uh, expanding the land on the south coast there. Well, it's the same thing here. Again, the material being created, uh, kind of this new, this, this, this material is being used to expand and create a new habitat, which should mean, you know, the contractor said themselves several times that they'll be leaving this site in a better state than they, they got it originally. It was pretty, pretty uninteresting, pretty uh, sparse monoculture of, a, of some arable farm, really. Not, not much use either from a, a biodiversity or a carbon perspective. So, all change. I'm uh, tactically placing my shoulder to, to kind of protect their security arrangements. But uh, actually behind me you can see some of the exposed face of that, uh, of the chalk, of where the chalk's going to go. Uh, what a horrible busy road this is. Um, yeah, much busier than the, and noisier than the railway ever will be by the way. Anyway, so that you can just about see behind me where that, where that is. So we're now, uh, just a, a vehicle has just gone past wetting the ground along here where the road actually crosses the uh, HS2 alignment. Um, so just that's to stop dust getting carried up by vehicles miles along um, but actually behind me you can see uh, well you can see this is the road you can see the uh, the um, the works going on I'm just walking on here this is a path that they've created as part of one of the closed rights of way this is a temporary closed rights of way this is one of the diversions um, so I'm walking along the reason I'm walking along is because we're about to reach in fact you can see some of the various preparatory works including launching a 990 meter long temporary uh, temporary sort of uh, jetty to enable access without damaging this the environment unduly just to enable access to actually build this viaduct this 3.4 kilometer long viaduct I've said all the numbers so many times haven't I but I don't know where where they're gonna pop up in the edit so but um here we are so I'm walking work working my way through um, they might be blocking because they might be about to move a vehicle across uh, so I'm gonna pause actually I'll, this chap will tell me what's going on in any case <laughs> This is where this is what's happening here. This is where the HS2 alignment will cross through. So that's uh, you no, know, it's just me. You can't really see much of what's going on. The reason I can do a spin, but it's because there's not really much to see here. Um, but this here, this this area here, is where the uh, they'll be launching the, that viaduct out across. So they'll be launching it, building it from this, basically from the same site, launching it out across uh, towards London. In fact, everything's happening from this single focal point this southern end of the uh, of the Chilton Tunnels. So you can see the route of HS2 going that way. Uh, they won't mind me filming here because it's very publicly accessible anyway. Um, and and then you can see it going that way. You can see the, uh, you can actually see the, the boating lake is just over there behind me. Let's see what else we can see. 
I'm working, work my way up the hill along this uh, diverted right of way to sort of see the extent of the site, see what we can see. And what's, what struck me actually is uh, how pleasant this little area is. <laughs> Just a short strip, a strip that I presume has been sterilized by these uh, telegraph poles or these power lines that are going overhead. But uh, it's quite nice. I'm regretting how heavy this bloody bag is. But uh, yeah, this is the sort of thing you might not see. Actually, Paul and Rebecca are good at it. Oh, damn, a fly just flew past. Paul and Rebecca are good at plodding. But uh, not so many people go out for a little stint, do they? Generally, you've got as far as public transport can get you and no further. Let's go over here into some woodland, shall we? Because it's the habitat. Look at this, this is lovely. You're all invertebrates. Loud enough to be heard over the uh, ambient noise, I think. If I look that way, you can see down where we've been. Just down there. Let's, uh, let's plod this way, I see a path. Let's follow it into some woodland, actually. This makes, rather neatly makes my point about habitat, is that the design can always, and has always accommodated as much as it can, any surrounding habitat and environment. And the logic here is that the work that's going to go on is going to enhance what is already here. Uh, it's actually going to leave, to, to my mind, a spectacular improvement in habitat quality. It does not take very long. You look at any, you look at Samphire Ho, or you look at, slipping in some mud, you look at HS1 and the old construction compounds there, gone almost impossible to find other than if you know where they were so uh it doesn't take long for things to settle in i'm getting brambled anyway where else am i going to find things i'm getting i'm losing myself amongst the wilderness here <laughs> i was gonna oh you can see some bits of it oh, if i climb back up the hill a bit you can see some bits better i was going to make a point about noise and about the fact that you can actually hear the construction noise now as i've kind of dropped down the lee of the hill a bit yeah you can see this is the uh, the end of the viaduct you can see the hint of hs2 work going on behind me um fly landed on my uh horse fly on my hand but um actually the racket from denham airfield is is worse that's noisy and then the road traffic is just the regular cars and then the M25 is the other side, so yes, it's noisy. It's definitely noisy. Watch out, I'm getting nettled and thistled to hell. Um, but uh, there's a lot of other ambient noise. This isn't a rural area particularly. Anyway. So I'm on the uh, South Buckinghamshire Way, which is lovely. Look, that's the South Buckinghamshire Way. That's nice, isn't it? Uh, let's head another direction. And would you know it, but uh, I'm going to briefly show it because, uh, you know, it's far away, but it looks cool. You can see all of the, uh, there it is, that I tap here to make sure it focuses in on that. You can see the uh, all the segments back there and that's the factory, all the factory work. All the civil engineering going on there to, to create both the viaduct, um, which uh, hopefully I'll talk more about. I've talked a bit about this video, but I'll talk more about it in another video, I think, if uh, if the HS2 and Align teams will have me back. Um, but also, of course, the, the tunnels, the two Chilton tunnels, there's two single bore tunnels, 32 kilometers worth of them and all of the segments and all of the work that goes into creating those uh, and then all of this then of course the habitat creating the habitat forming the habitat which i think will uh either i've talked about already or i'm going to talk about key point um which i think is uh not unfortunate but an inevitability of heavy civil engineering all of that all of that over there all of it all of that will last for over three years. There'll be over three years worth of, of, of heavy engineering going on there, all for the benefit of passengers that'll disappear. You know, they'll go through that tunnel three and a half years, three more than three years to create those tunnels. And it'll only take three and a half minutes for trains to pass through them. Three and a half years, all for three and a half minutes. I'm just trotting along here to spot something which I think will make a point rather nicely. But um, yeah, I'm still in the South Buckinghamshire Way. Been diverted a couple of times around the site, but uh, <laughs> it's quite a nice walk actually in this increasingly hot weather. And I've not had, not really had much breakfast and I've certainly not had any lunch and it's quarter to three. But anyway, 
what can we spot? Oh, I'm in a tunnel. Don't look into the light. Yeah, it's another tunnel. Echo. Yeah, nice. Um, where am I? Where have I just come from? From the from the, the full, oh no, oh, bloody hell! It's just a void over there. Still from the vegetation. Um, where have I come from? Well, we're going to walk this way. What, where I've come from is uh, I've come from particularly echoey. Nice bird song at the other end. Um, I'm under the the. Uh, I am under Britain's biggest roundabout. Hooray, it's the M25. Why have I come under here? It's because, well, firstly, scale, look at the, this isn't a th tunnel that things go through. This is simply a tunnel underneath the width of the M25, giving an idea of how wide that formation is. Much length that way, some more length that way. Anyway, um, the reason I'm under here is because uh, the M25 uh, has uh, direct slip roads that feed the site that we've just been plodding around on. So I thought it'd be interesting from a logistics perspective. Uh, people, so the, the workers access through through the town on the local road network, but no construction traffic, no deliveries, nothing heavy comes along local roads. It all comes, or by and large, I'd imagine, maybe the odd exception here and there. By and large, uh, everything's coming off the M25 directly, so uh, that's quite good. That's the M25. Now that's noisy. So I'm walking back, I'm actually in the fields. You can't really see, you can see, you can see a gantry in the M25 there. Uh, you can see stuff, I'm walking, I'm making my way back. I took a taxi to the site, boo. But uh, I shared it with Paul, so it's not so bad. Um, uh, remind me to prod Paul, he owes me a coffee for the, for the fair. But um, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm now walking through a nice bit of, uh, nice bit of, uh, well, looks like farmer's set aside, to be honest. Uh, and um, because it's time for me to do the outro bit of the video. What have we talked about? We've talked about, let's, let's round off. We talked mostly about the, the tunnels. Uh, and I'm sure I've done some, I don't know if I'm going to do some uh, in the studio filler material to, to, to fill the gaps. Who knows? It'll come out in the edit, possibly, or maybe it won't. Uh, uh, anyway, so there's that. What else? We talked, so that was about all the factory, all the, basically we looked very much at the segments, the tunnel elements. We haven't really looked at the segment creation for the bridge, the viaduct, so I hope we're going to do that next time. It'd be good to see those getting created and actually seeing them getting launched would be fantastic. Uh, close up. It'd be nice if we could actually go out part way along. Woohoo! Make it happen, Ben. Anyway, so we talked about that. We didn't really talk, we talked a bit about the viaduct, a little bit about where, actually I say, said where it's launched. It's not quite where it's launched. That's where some of the piers are being, um, some of the, the, the piles are being driven for the, for the piers. Um, but actually the, the launch, you can see on, 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 on the aerial footage, on the aerial view, you can see a long strip, which is where the, that bridge will be launched out from. Um, oh, there's some nice, nice people coming in the background. So I'll leave them in peace and quiet. I'll film this way. So, um, and then we talked about habitat. I'm stood here in some nice sort of, well, it's arable, <laughs> meh. But um, yeah, whatever. Some nice set aside over here and there's some nice woody bits and we've just walked on the South Buckinghamshire Way, which is very nice. Um, talking about habitats and talking about the, the kind of the long-term legacy that, that the project leaves. All it really remains for me to say is, uh, is this this is you know you know what the drill is yeah uh, thanks to all the list the, the audio only listeners uh, we're outside in this nice field you get some nice wind through tree sound effect yeah, there's some nice trees behind us um, you, thanks to all the audio people for listening you can listen to this in all good audio uh, podcasting places 
uh, support me on uh, on Patreon. Uh, patreon.com slash Gareth Dennis that's always very helpful uh, it allows me to continue doing this sort of nonsense including being outside in the sun which is not too bad uh, actually you know taking an annual leave to do this sort of thing what else uh, oh yeah um, you can uh, you can go onto the discord onto the discord server uh, which uh, Gareth Dennis at UK slash discord that, uh, that'll um, all the chat happens there I'm sure there'll be plenty of discussion on here you can go into the stop stop HS2 channel and find out what the latest shenanigans of that now basically collapsed organisation is uh, and the wider discussions in relation to it uh, and the last thing of course is you can uh, in chocolate pennies on PayPal if you're so fancy paypal.me slash Gareth Dennis and um, yeah, so that's uh, that's those. Oh, of course. What's happening next week? Well, next week is going to be fascinating, I'm sure. No, ma- no I don't know what it is. Uh, I've got to cover both solemn and wacky, uh, and of course solemn. Uh, so next week, uh, what is it going to be, future Gareth? Let's hear. Thank you, past Gareth. Uh, it's going to be me nattering for an hour. Can I do it in the Railway Museum North Shed? Uh, join and find out. Very nice. That sounds engaging. Nattery could be solemn, could be wacky. We don't know. Could be informative, could be highly uninformative. I'm sure it'll be good. So that's it. That's that's it. That's all of the things. Uh, all thanks. The things. It's all the things. All oh, the things. Fran Scott. Fran. Hello. hello. Fran. It's Fran. Fran. We've just spent going around in a minibus and then going through the factory. I mean, I've been shouting and yelling into my camera very excitedly. What do you think? What, what did you think of the site? Tell us about what you saw. It's incredible to see a TBM up so close, even if it is her butt. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Um, but it was just, in terms of to see it at this stage, is mind blowing. But then also in terms of, and I can't wait to come back to sort of see how it progresses. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but then also to see the factory of where the segments were made and that whole process and obviously it all being purpose built and it's just the amount of work and thought and expertise that's going into yeah, it absolutely. is mind-blowing. The level of skills, I mean, I guess the fact that this is it's so self-contained is what I find impressive. The only real thing that's coming in and out are, are the people making it happen. But the material coming out, the tunnel is staying here, yeah. the segments are being created here. It's, it's, it's phenomenal. And it's all quite it's hidden as well. It you is. Like, you yeah. wouldn't know. I mean, not so very long away. There, there's a line of trees that I filmed over there that is going to appear in B roll magically now. But also, you can see there's, there's, there's the tree line all behind us. It's quite well nestled in, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Given that we're also right next to the M25, which kind of hides it on the other side, too. Yeah. Um, so, uh, anything else that you thought was interesting that you. That I was like, um, I think. There's, there's, <laughs> there's so much. Um, I know, like, the, we found out about the toilets, which is good. The so there are three um, toilets. And just the fact that it's so long, the TBM. Yeah. Like, I suppose that was the thing that surprised me. I just didn't expect it. One, I didn't expect it to be hollow, which yeah. is naive on my point, I suppose, because the stuff's got to come out and go in. You can see, you um, see the foot, that, that square shape for vehicles to go in and out. Yeah, yeah. And then the other thing was in terms of, yeah, it's length and how... What I loved is in terms of the jigsaw pieces of the segments and how yeah. they can slightly shift them to the left or to the yeah, right. Yeah, to, to just throw all to that horizontal yeah. vertical alignment. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so There's lots of really ingenious bustle. That's it. It's the little little bits of ingenuity here and there. They're just they're just fantastic. Fran, thanks so much for uh, for, for for the for the closing words. Um, <laughs> all I'm going to do is 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 basically bid you farewell. Thanks everyone for watching, and um, and we'll see you we'll see you next time. Cheerio.